This morning, uh, the sermon title is A Road, Roadmap to Restoration. That's a nice way of saying, how do we deal with conflict? You know, in all of life, um, we will never go through life without having to deal with conflict. It's a part of our journey. You know, for me, I used to think, why, why do we have conflict? I mean, aren't we all followers of Christ? You know, when you look at the book, in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down, it says that the church committed itself, gave itself to, to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and they had everything in common, and, and, and they gave away their things, and they were just this beautiful picture of, of unity within the body of Christ. And, and a lot of times, I, I, I say it myself, I hear other people say, why can't we be like the, 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 um, the early church? Why can't we be like the early church? And yet, when you look at the early church, it didn't take them long from Acts chapter 2 until Acts chapter 6, where they had to deal with conflict. You know, there were the, the, the Grecian widows who weren't being treated like they thought they should, and so there was conflict that they had to resolve. We go to Acts chapter 15, there was conflict at, in, at the Jerusalem Council, and, and much of Paul's writings, um, his epistles, are addressing conflict and how we navigate it. And so, so conflict isn't a bad thing, it's a part of our sanctification journey. And this morning, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, we're going to talk about uh, Paul and how we prepare ourselves for conflict. Now, next week, we're going to be doing a Vision Sunday, and so Keith is going to be preaching about one of our core values. We're going to be doing some training for our D group leaders, and then I'm, I'm going to be leading um, a discussion where we're going to go deeper into how we resolve conflict, the difference the different styles of conflict, the three different ways people approach conflict, and we're just going to dive deeper into this area of conflict, and what do I do when I find myself in conflict? So this morning we're talking about uh, Philippians chapter 4 and just preparing ourselves for uh, when we find ourselves in conflict. And so if you would, in Philippians chapter 4, um, beginning in verse 2, Paul says this, I plead with you, Yoidia, I plead with you, Syntyche, to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, yoke fellow, uh, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel among, along with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think on such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it to practice. And God's peace, and the God of peace will be with you. God, would you help us just to open our hearts and our minds to hear? And understand these words that Paul has written to the Philippians, but also to us today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So the book of Philippians is the book of joy, and it's this beautiful, uh, lofty explanation of Christ in the first few chapters. And Paul warns the Philippian church of, uh, of false teachers in the first a uh, few chapters, but, but why would Paul, after this beautiful explanation of who Christ is and, and covering all this doctrine and warning against false teachers, why would he all of a sudden in chapter 4 be talking about 
two women who disagree. I mean, why is, what's the purpose of that? I think it's because Paul understood that divisiveness in a church will cripple it. That disunity will rob a church of its power and destroy its testimony. Paul realized that the church should be a place where people can love and support each other, hold each other accountable, care for each other. But he understands in order for this to happen, in order for the church to be effective, there has to be harmony and unity. And so he realizes that unity, because, it is, because there's a threat if there isn't unity, that this has to be confronted. This is a big deal. See, this isn't just two women disagreeing. This is two women who potentially are going to destroy the unity of the church. Because conflict in our churches, conflict between people generates instability in a congregation. And so they pose, these women pose a threat to the church's stability. So Paul knew it had to be addressed. And if not, the church could um, really, their, their health could be at risk. And Paul also, in, in the book of Ephesians and in Colossians, we see how critically important unity is. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another. Make every effort to keep the unity. That's talking to the church in Ephesus. And to the church in Colossae, he says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven. Verse 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you were called to live at peace. So we see here in, in Ephesians and we see in Colossians that unity was a big deal in the church. And actually early in Philippians, in chapter 1, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a matter worthy of the gospel. Then whenever I come to you, he says, I know that you will stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for faith of the gospel. Then in chapter 2, he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one spirit and one purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition. So we see that Paul is serious about unity. He says, we need to be united and love one another. Now, being united doesn't mean we always agree on everything. We learn how to disagree and how to talk through our differences. So here in chapter 4, then, these two women, he says, I plead with you, Yodia. I plead with you, Sinti, to agree with each other in the Lord. Twice he says, I plead with you. I'm pleading, I'm begging, I'm encouraging you to address this issue with these, with these two women. Now, we don't know much about these two women. We know they were members of the church. Um, we know that they were prominent women, well-respected within the church at Philippi, but apparently this was causing a dispute. So here's Paul's instruction on how they were to address this. It was very simple, very direct. He focuses on the step. He, actually, Paul here, what I want you to understand is he really focuses on this is how I need to prepare myself to deal with conflict. 
And he says, first of all, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, what kind of rejoicing can happen when we're in conflict? Why would I rejoice? Well, again, it's a matter of perspective. You know, if I have put my faith in Christ, um, if I am in the Lord, then it says that I've been forgiven. My sins have been forgiven. All the mistakes I have ever made, all the sins I have ever committed have been forgiven because of Christ. And therefore, when I find myself in conflict, when I recognize how incredibly I have been forgiven by Christ, it should help me to look at the people that I'm in conflict with differently because I am forgiven. Then I need to have the same attitude towards them as Christ had towards me. And when I can look at my brother and sister in Christ and recognize, you know what, I've been forgiven, they've been forgiven, we need to work together. And we need to allow God to work in us to help us to grow in character and love. There again, this is a part of the sanctification process. We have to remember, we are a group of very imperfect people who are walking a journey of sanctification that will take the rest of our lives until we enter heaven. So we're just a bunch of imperfect people figuring out how to love each other and being able to forgive each other as Christ has forgiven us. So, so when we can rejoice and remember that we rejoice in the Lord, it reminds me, and what Paul's saying is, look, remember, you've been forgiven. You need to extend the same grace to those around you. It's a mindset. Then Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That word gentleness means large-hearted, gentle, courteous, considerate, generous. It's the, the absolute opposite of irritable, rude, abrasive. It's describing the quality of a person who is in Christ. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. saying that, look, if I, as a follower of Christ, when I find myself in conflict, I must address it with much gentleness. When I respond, and he says, a gentleness that is evident to all. So let me ask you, the last conflict you were in, because I, I would guess that all of you in the last week have been in conflict, whether it's with your spouse, your children, your siblings, your teachers, your friends, your employer, your employee. You have been in conflict. I'll just admit, I've been in conflict with my wife from time to time this last week. But when I, doesn't mean conflict is wrong, but when I am in conflict, do I do it with much gentleness? As Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. I read this book uh, a couple weeks ago called Gospel Fluency by a guy named Jeff Vanderstelt. He makes this comment. He said, we should live our lives in such a way that a watching world demands an answer. You see, when we as followers of Christ do conflict well, when we do it with gentleness and, a, and the world watches us deal with conflict in, in, with much forgiveness and much gentleness, they step back and they say, what's going on there? 
I want to know how you do that. When we live our lives as followers of Christ and we address things like conflict with gentleness, the world wants an answer. They want to know why. And I wonder, does Dwayne live his life that way? Do people look at me and say, what makes him different? How can he address this conflict like this? Are we just like the rest of the world? Our gentleness Can be contagious. Do I approach my conflict? As you think back over the last week, have you approached conflict with gentleness? When you were in conflict with your wife, did you remind yourself that I was forgiven for being a sinner? I must forgive her. Because she's a sinner too. I mean, don't tell my wife I said that, but is she here? Oh, there she is. She's a beautiful sinner, um, forgiven by Christ. But so am I. So am I. And when I can look at people in that way, it helps me to approach it in a Christ-like way. So I look at... The people I'm in conflict with remind myself, I've been forgiven, they've been forgiven. I approach them with much gentleness. And then the next thing Paul says, he says, replace your anxiety with prayer. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Huh, the third step of developing a good attitude towards conflict is to get rid of my anxious thoughts. How do I get rid of my anxious thoughts? I lay them at the feet of the cross. I give them to Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything present your prayers and petitions before God. When you're in conflict, how often do you present the things you're in conflict with or the person you're in conflict with, how often do you present them to God? Say, God, look, here you go. This is causing anxiety in me. This is making me angry. But Lord, I'm going to give it to you because you said that I'm not supposed to be anxious about anything. Now that Greek word anxious means laden with care, troubles, pressured, squeezed, burdened, under stress. So these are some hard things. You know, this isn't just little anxious thoughts. This is, these are some hard things. Lay all of these hard things, all of your troubles, all of your cares, lay them at the cross. You know, and most of the time, our anxiety or, or, or when we're in conflict, it's the people we're closest to and that we love the most that we are the harshest with. But, you know, mom and dad, are you in conflict with your child right now? Um, teenagers, young people, are you in conflict at all, ever, with your parents? None of them. They're just saying, no. My parents are awesome. Do you ever, when you're in conflict with mom and dad, present your anxious thoughts to God? Say, God, can you take care of my conflict with my parents? Because we don't, we don't do that. We don't take time to, to process because... because you see, conflict 
resolution, it's not just a one-time event that we get together, we work, talk through it, and it's gone. It's a journey that we're always on. It's a journey that we're on um, when we talk about resolution. And Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And he says, here's the result. When I do that, when I present these things to God, all of my anxious thoughts, all of these hard things I'm going, he says, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Huh. Paul says, when I present all of these anxieties, when I present this conflict to God and I, I turn it over to him, he says, he promises, he says, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. Paul knew that our anxious thoughts had a way of creeping back into our minds. Some of you are more anxious than others. So he says, you have to present them to God on a regular basis. Every day, present your requests, your anxieties to God. So what, what, what thing right now do you have that you need to present to God? What anxiety are you feeling with in a relationship that you need to present to God? Why don't you write that down? Why don't you just write it down? Just take a couple minutes, just write that down. What is that one thing? I want you to commit that situation, that person, to prayer this week. To not be anxious about it, and to allow the peace of God that transcends all understanding to guard your heart and your mind in this. Now, this is, like I said, this is a journey that we're on, not a one-time event. And so, so you're going to have to present this request to God day after day after day, this afternoon, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Every day present this request to God to, to give this thing to Him slowly but surely, if you're faithful in this, God will allow you to grow and to have peace with your situation. And he will allow you, which allows us, you see, when we go, when we deal with conflict, when we're at peace in our own hearts, it allows us to go to people with much gentleness and love. It allows us to deal with conflict in a Christ-like way. And again, when we deal with conflict in a Christ-like way, the watching world wonders, huh, they demand an answer for why we can do that the way we do it. How are you dealing with conflict? What conflict right now do you have that you need to address? Because when we deal with conflict, this is why conflict can be such 
a good thing. Dealt with correctly, it preaches the gospel. It preaches the gospel. It ultimately brings glory to God. It's a process, though, not an event. And it really, when we begin to present and to pray and give this to the Lord, it helps us to see things as they really are. See, when I am stuck deep in conflict, I don't always see a clear picture. I have a filter that I look through, my own filter, my own thoughts. There's things I don't know that I fill in the blanks that t oftentimes aren't completely correct. And so as I replace this anxiety with prayer, it helps me to develop a more accurate view of the person I'm in conflict with. Because when we're in conflict, we tend to focus on all the negatives of that person. They are such a jerk. They are so, they do this and they do that. And they, we, just, we, we think of all the negatives. Sometimes even with our spouse. We think of all the negatives because we have a wrong view. When you guys are in conflict with your parents, you always think of all the bad things. They don't ever let me do anything. They don't like when I have fun. They don't trust me. Right, am I? See, I was a teenager once too, so I know exactly how you're thinking. But I was the parent of a teenager at one time, and so I know how as a parent think, and I can do the same thing. But as we connect with God, as we press into God, my view can begin to change and remind me that, huh, my parents love me. They give me a place to live. They give me food to eat. They love me. They care for me. They do all these things. And, and we begin to get a different view because my, my view is beginning to change because Christ is changing me. And we often get distorted views because of the hurt that we have in our own lives. You know, Steve Bixler, um, who does a, um, all of our counseling here and caring for the heart, he always talks about the five boxes. Um, and, and box one is things that have, have happened to us. And the first two boxes we don't control. Things that have happened to me that were hurtful make me feel this certain way. We don't choose what was done to us and even how we feel. These things cause a certain feeling. And then those feelings cause us to think a certain way. They, they cause me um, to have negative thoughts and I begin to tell lies to myself. And then when I am hurt, immediately I go to negative thoughts. This person is all these bad things. And when I have this response, when, when I have those negative thoughts, I will respond in a negative way. But when I begin to be healed... I still don't choose these two things that, that happened to me and that caused me to feel this way, but as I'm healed from my past, the negative thoughts go away. And the lies that Satan tells me go away, which enables me to respond in a healthy way when I find myself in conflict. Because when I'm in conflict, I, I, I respond in one of two ways, either with anger or gentleness. But it's really important to have a right view of myself so that I can handle conflict better. And when I experience healing in my life, I can respond with gentleness. And I can tell you, and I hope Verda can tell you, that when we went and we got some counseling a number of years ago, when I got a better view of myself, I began to respond to her when we were in conflict in a much more gentle, loving, Christ-like way. Because we see people differently.
we begin to see them um, the way Christ sees them. Now, Paul's not saying that we shouldn't address conflict. It's not what he's saying. In fact, remember in Galatians, he says, brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore them gently. We need to confront sin. Matthew 18, if a brother has hurt you, Matthew says, you need to go to them. Show them their sin. So we're not talking about not dealing with it. We're just saying, when you have conflict, you need to deal with it with love and gentleness. That's what Paul is saying here. We need to deal with conflict with love and gentleness. It begins with me having a right view of myself. So next week, we'll we'll talk a lot more about how we deal with that. But as we gain a more balanced view of of the person we're in conflict with, a more Christ-like view through a filter of Christ, it's often easier to overlook minor offenses as well. You know, many marriages, friendships, business relationships can be damaged or destroyed when we focus exclusively on our disagreements. That's often what we do. We just focus on disagreements. But often with our friendships, we forget what, what when we're in disagreement, we forget what what really made us friends, what we like about each other. In our marriages, we often forget what what attracted us to each other initially because we're focusing just on the negatives. But as as I receive healing, as I allow God to work in me, I begin to see Um, and remember what what attracted me to Verda 35, 40 years ago. Or or, or your friend who you've been friends with for for, for 10 years, all of a sudden you begin like, that's that's why I love this person. Or maybe you have a business partner. that you forgot why you enjoyed doing business together. You've lost your focus. You, you focus just on the negative. When as followers of Christ, it's important that we see people the way Christ sees them. And as we see that, we can do conflict in a Christ-like way, in a way that a watching world wonders how we can do that. And finally, Paul says, just practice what you've learned. He says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the peace of God will be with you. As believers, as we read scripture, as we hear sermons, as we go to our D groups, put into practice the word of God. Practice what you've learned, what God's word says. Just, Paul says very simply, put it into practice. Are you putting into practice the things you've learned? Are you doing conflict the way God's word says we should do conflict? Yeah, church, we have an opportunity to preach the gospel simply through the way we live our life. Now, we have to speak it out loud with words. But our words have to be backed up by the way we live. But we have this opportunity 
to show the world a better way to do conflict, to do resolution, a way that preaches the gospel, a way that shows people who Jesus is. So my, my challenge to you this week is think about those conflicts that you find yourself in or that you're going to find yourself in um, and ask yourself, how do I, as a follower of Christ, how do I approach this in a way that can bring reconciliation and restoration? Because there is a way to do that. It begins by presenting it to God and saying, God, here it is. So that name that you've got, that conflict you find yourself in, I want you to take that, I want you to put it in front of you, I want you to write it down, and I want you to every day give that to Jesus. Give that anxiety to him. And watch the peace of God come upon you. Let's pray. Father, I, uh, I thank you for your word. I thank you for um, just... Uh, the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that gives us the ability, the power that you give us to, to love people in a way that's unexplainable. Lord, those names we've written down this morning, I pray that right now you would begin to do a work, first of all, in us. That, that we could, um, first of all, rejoice and, and remember that we've been forgiven. I pray that as we remember that, that we would also remember to be gentle. In our encounters. And Lord, that we would you would replace our anxiety, our anxiousness with peace as we present and give you through prayer our anxieties. And Father, that our the way we deal with this the way we encounter and work through conflict with our children and with our parents, with our spouses, with our friends, or to preach the gospel. And Lord, we would make you famous by the way we live our lives and the way we walk through conflict to resolution. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.